Hello, everybody. It is great to be here one more time today. And my name is Gary Fowler. I am the CEO, president, and the founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios, primary AI and quantum venture studio located in the heart of Silicon Valley. I'm a 17-time serial entrepreneur with several unicorns under my belt. I was on the original management team of Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce, and also the co-founder of EVID.AI, an AI HR tech company located in the heart of Silicon Valley. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, but the opportunities are not. With GSD, we go around the world looking for companies that are going to make a dent in the universe. We have 127 companies from 55 countries today. So with that, I've got um, William McKnight here today. He's a president at McKnight Consulting Group. He's a strategy and projects person with a deep, 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 deep background, understanding data analytics. He's an author. He's a speaker. He's an educator. Um, he's a number one global influencer in big data, number one in data center, number one in cloud, seven in analytics. Man, he's got the whole top 10 lined up. Uh, and on the top list for master's data management in cloud um, in 2022. With that, I'd like to bring William on board. Hi, William. Hi, William. How are you today? Hi, Gary. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. So tell me a little bit about it. How does somebody that goes from uh, Southern Adventist University, you've got your bachelor's degree in computer science. Where is that, by the way? College Dale, Tennessee. Now, are, are you originally from Tennessee? No, I'm from Florida. So yeah, okay. why in the why in the world did you go to Tennessee? Would you like wake up one day and say, oh, I want to just uh, get away from everything? I just didn't have a lot of options presented to me. We were sort of uh, not, un we didn't really, uh, we, my, my mom and I didn't really understand uh, the market, how to navigate all that. But I mean, I ended up having a good education. Mm -hmm. The university was uh, associated with my church at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was one of, it was, it was actually the closest uh, that was that. And they got me recruited in there and away I went. That's interesting. So is it is a is a Southern Adventist the same as seven day Adventist? It is. It, it is associated with that. Yes. That's interesting. So what is a seven day Adventist? Anyhow, I mean, I understand, uh -huh. but I, you know, I hear about it. But what's what are the differences? It's interesting. Oh, we're going to talk religion. Um, <laughs> it's it's a conservative Christian denomination. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was formed out of there was there was a group called the Millerites back in the mid 1800s mm -hmm. who were expecting the second coming of Christ. And they and a bunch of them in the northeast of the U.S., they sold all their belongings. They went to the top of hills. They waited on this one particular night for Jesus to come. Obviously, he didn't come, <laughs> but some of them couldn't let it go and sort of change the timelines and the story associated with it all. And and kept kept it going and called themselves Seventh Day Adventists. And the seventh day is Saturday, so Saturday is their. Oh, Sabbath. that's interesting. Yeah. It's like I the Jewish Sabbath, sundown right. Friday to sundown Saturday. So I grew up not doing very much, I'll say, in that time frame every week. So that limited my sports and things of that nature, whatever. But that's what they're that's what they're about. Oh, that, they're going that's so, but that was a say about the same time uh, as the um, Church of Latter Day Saints, right? Because yeah. the thing in Palm yeah. Island, New York, yeah. the same thing, right? You're I right. Mean, were they related groups at all, or not? They, there were a lot of parallels, mm -hmm. and they may have kind of watched each other and did some things together. Uh, not only the Mormons, um, but also the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, no kidding, boy. That's in, that's so interesting. Yeah, really, boy. You it's tell, an interesting story. I, I recommend I everybody with, look into it. My whole life, I wondered with the story. I, I had gone to a Mormon church just to see what it was like. It was really quite interesting. And then I read about Maroni, and you know, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Wow, that's that's in, and so how was it in Tennessee? It must have been. That's not. Well, I mean, that's not like a big. Uh, it's not like Nashville or Memphis, right? No, this was this was just outside of Chattanooga, mm -hmm. so still small town. Uh, College of Dale is an especially small town. It's actually in the heart of the rug central uh, of, for the United States. So rugs are made there in that general area. It's on the border of, of Georgia. 
Ah, like Dalton. Uh, Dalton yeah. is one of the big names. That's, that's right there. Yeah. Wow, that's great. People know it for that. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. And so mm -hmm. if you look at lessons learned going to the, the university and you were studying computer science, what were the lessons? It had to be quite interesting because you're like small town and mass society, right? Was it, yeah. did it take a while? Because you went to Santa Clara next. So which well, was it was, it was uh, universities for computer science back then yeah. were, with a lot of programming. It was a lot of programming languages. So I learned Fortran, Pascal, COBOL, uh, you name it, those kinds of languages, which are obviously not, not around anymore, but you got the concept of programming down by learning these languages. And I just went all in on it. I mean, I would stay after and, and, and program games that fellow students wanted to play. And that was, you know, kind of nice for me. And so that, that sort of cemented this idea that I stay in computer science, whatever that means. And it, it all started back in high school when I didn't have much direction on career and a uh, teacher of computer science, which was nothing like it is now, but a teacher of computer science back then said, you need to do this. This is what you need to do. And that was all it took. I was like, okay. And so I just stayed with it. I got, I fell into IBM for uh, one of my first, my first job out of university. And I interviewed in four different areas of IBM. One of them was DB2. And at the end of the day, the HR manager said, take your pick. We all, uh, they all want you. So what will it be? It was DB2, IMS, CICS, and I picked well. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was doing, but DB2 sounded pretty cool. So I went into that and that's a database, obviously. And I've stayed with within that realm ever since. And it has just grown really big. And then what about, so were you at IBM when you went to Santa Clara University? I was, yeah, it was a night program. So work during the day, go to school at night. And I loved it. I love continuing my education. And, well, uh, I, you know, Santa Clara University is nice. It's right on El Camino Real, right? And it is, it is. Beautiful, beautiful campus. Uh, uh, so everybody out there, if you get a chance at a clear, University is a really nice place. So yeah. you did IBM, you worked there a couple years, right? Like three years. three years. And then what made you decide, you know, as you're going down through your journey, you didn't uh, know that you were going to be in databases, but what made you decide to go ahead and, you know, work for Platinum? Um, I, I hate to say it, but I, I wanted to make some more money, Gary. <laughs> there you go. Hey, at least you're honest. And uh, that gave me an opportunity to do that, but also gave me an opportunity to spread my wings uh, a bit. And my job there was to travel week in, week out to different places across the country and teach DB2 and all its various forms, SQL, some of the other tools, system administration, design. So I was learning on the fly and they were giving me, as a young company, Platinum was was a young startup then. They gave me a lot of responsibility, and I like that. I hope you got some good stock options. I, I got a bit. I, I was there when they when they uh, when they when they went public. Yes. Oh, that's good. That was nice. So you did that, and then you went. Okay, so you go there, and then you go to Visa. What made you decide to go to Visa? Because Visa's, uh, you know, if you look at Platinum. You know, here's a young company that's growing. Then you go to Visa, it's this corporate uh, behemoth, right? How was that? I mean, the politics are a lot different too, right? Oh, I'd like to tell you, Gary, that I was following a plan and and uh, this is what I wanted to do all along. But it was really just opportunities presented to me at the time. Platinum, I was getting burned out on the travel week in and week out. And also their California affiliate, which I was associated with, was kind of falling apart otherwise. Get, they were getting into the year 2000, which after the year 2000 turned over, wasn't really, didn't really amount to much and things like this. So for various reasons, I crawled into the cube uh, at Visa. Actually, I started as a contractor and eventually hired on there. And those were the early days of data warehousing. Well, wow. and so, so uh, you do the Visa, was that Santa Mateo or someplace, right? So it was in still yeah. California. Foster City Martin and San Mateo, yeah. And then you go to Anthem, you move up to a, a VP level, 
you know, how was that? You you were there one year. How was it going from a director to a VP? That's quite a big step. Uh, it, it was a big step. Uh, became a lot more, shall we say, political. It became a lot more making sure that a lot of uh, executive constituents were happy. And it was a real challenging time. Uh, my boss was the, was the CIO of Anthem and was going through some things and uh, kind of took it out on all of us that reported to her. And we kind of all left uh, yeah. within the same few months. And uh, and that's when I went back to Silicon Valley, which I preferred anyway, and and uh, got into my consulting. So you went over to McKnight's Associates and that you founded that company or or you're the founder? I did. I did. Why did you name it McKnight? Lack of creativity. <laughs> it sounds like, you know, some British uh, organization. Well, that's my last name, Gary. So I just went yeah. with it. You know, there's. Oh, there's so you just company. wanted to put your, no, I got it. I got it. <laughs> but I like it. I mean, it's, it's interesting. So McKnight Associates and, and, um, and what does it mean? A leading professional services company? What does leading mean? Yeah, we were strategic. We still are. I mean, McKnight Consulting Group now and McKnight Associates, then we are strategic in nature. We think of the big picture. We're not just programming. We're not just bodies, if you will. We think of, we think big, we act small, but our associates, our employees, our architects, anybody that goes out under the McKnight name, they have some breadth to them and they can go in different directions. That's one of the hallmarks of my hires and what we do here. And so- yeah. Are you, you still know. with McKnight, though? Because it says you were only there till 2005. I sold the company. I grew it to a certain level. I sold it to a public company, and I went to them for three years in a kind of earnout mode, right? Yeah. And uh, after a while, spun back out McKnight Consulting Group, and that's what I'm still running now. I think it's been 12, 13 years. How is it when you go through having a company, then you go over to Conversion Services International, right? as a senior VP, how is it after being the big boss and, you know, calling the shots and then go over to a company where you're now senior VP and you've got the political situation again? How was that? Well, it was still a small company um, and I still ran my practice in much the same way as I did before, but it was really challenging because you have other influences on you uh, all the time and fitting into structure and not just, I think sometimes a person like me who's trying to be a thought leader and publishing, speaking, doing all that sort of thing, as well as running the practice, sometimes those things aren't as appreciated in a larger project because they're all about the day-to-day -day sales. Why aren't you out there flogging the, flogging the enterprises and trying to get more, get more business today and i'm i'm saying there's a longer term picture here there's a bigger picture here there's a branding that we want to be doing there's we want to attract business you cannot attract business by calling onesie twosie all the time you have to you have to create a brand in the marketplace and that's what i did and i've kept it going interesting you know we got a question paul um, somebody says, what certification we recommend for the future in AI and computer science programming? I'm not aware of any certifications that I, that I can recommend right now. I know there's a lot of education that's happening out there. Um, but I really don't, I don't know if any certifications for it. I think what employers are looking for these startups and so on, they're looking for people with a track record, people that have been around the AI or data ecosystem. Those are some of the hot areas. Security, also hot, been around it, done things in it, can talk the talk. And you don't necessarily have to know the language that they're going to be programming in, but you've, you've shown that you can learn the language. You're willing to, you're willing to change as the, you know, these companies are changing so frequently in their direction. You're willing to change with that. So build your track record is, is what I would say. And you can do this now with the tools on the side if, if yeah, your no, I, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, care for it. I agree with you. And then, you know, one of the, another question that Paul is asking, 
At IBM, did you learn anything that made most programmers fail? That made most programmers fail. Yeah. Did what? What did you learn? You know that that you shouldn't do when you're a programmer. Well, you shouldn't. I'll, I'll give. Okay, number one, this was uh, this came out a few times for all of us there, um, but but don't assume that something will not will not happen in the in the broad marketplace <laughs> of your product. You have to test every fork of the code, every pos every business possibility, every user possibility, and you have to account for that with the code. Even these things that happen one in a thousand times a user will log in. You have to account for that with your code. And sometimes you'll spend 80% of the time working on that very insignificant part of the code, but you still got to do it. It's it's important because a breakdown means the whole thing comes down and then you're 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 still working on that. You're doing it in an emergency situation then. So you really just have to fork the code, uh, be, Use, use some of these uh, debugging tools that make sure that every line of the code is executed. If you're a smaller shop, you don't have access to this. We had a whole department that, that did this and integrated code. Obviously there's, I don't know how many programmers on DB2, 200 of us. Wow. And you know we're all working on our, our piece of the code and it has to fit together. And there's all these releases and patches and versions. So we had a whole department that took care of that. I shouldn't say took care of, it's our responsibility too, but um, you have to simulate that if you, do, if you don't have that department. Simulate, wow, interesting. So, you know, let's go forward. So you look at, you know, what you've been uh, doing globally. And if you look at the market, so you went to Lucidity, uh, now back at McKnight, but what, in terms of the market, what kind of changes do you see now? I mean, especially with ChatGPT and the impact that's having on this this infobesity problem that we have. Where are we with that, and what what do you think is going to happen next? You know, in terms I'm, of I'm a huge believer in this is the next huge wave, and it's going to be a tsunami. I mean, every project needs to consider how will how can we do this better with AI. So all these enterprises that are looking at their roadmap, planning their strategic initiatives over the course of the next year, two, three, they have to consider for each one of those, how do we do this more efficiently, more effectively with AI? We also have to get our all our data now. We can't just let the data go. We can't just use it and throw it away. It has historical value. So we need to start accumulating that data. You can do that with a data lake now. It's not as expensive as it used to be, you know, to just store that data, store it well, store it governed, store it with ability to get at it. So performance of that data is very important. So what I would say is data has become more important. So make sure that you are doing a great job with your data in an enterprise. Make sure you are capturing all of it in the right vessel to succeed. I said data lake, but there's also data warehouses master data management, some data belongs in a graph database. There's no one size fits all. You have to understand the different data management systems and make sure the data gets routed to the one or more that it makes sense for it to go to. And then you have to make sure it's all integrated. And this is the foundation for AI, the foundation for the future. So uh, people wanna get into AI, but if you don't have the data, you can't do that. Now there's data for sale, and we can get into that, but it's your data that's going to make the difference. Yeah. So you look at it. I mean, I mean, think about these problems that we have, Paul. I mean, even in your own personal cloud, right? You got about three hundred thousand items. The entire web in nineteen ninety six was two hundred fifty seven thousand websites. You pull more information in personal cloud, the entire web, and we look at that number, and it's doubling every year. In five years, you're going to have ten million items. How in the world? I mean, I don't know about you, but. I have a problem trying to find email. I get so many messages across multiple repositories that it's getting to the point of, I don't look at it like instantly, I can't find it. It's too far down or it's in junk or something. How do we address this infobesity problem that we have? I mean, data is really following Moore's law, isn't it? Because it used to be 
somebody would go around in the manufacturing floor with a clipboard and you know do a check every half an hour okay done now there's multiple of those every second multiple read readouts of just about anything you can read out every second and that's that's new data digital data that becomes important because you want to do predictive maintenance you want to have an efficient supply chain and efficient manufacturing arm and so on so how do we deal with this we i think the technical po uh, possibilities are there for <coughs> every enterprise every company we're just not availing ourselves completely of it now there will come a time when we may outpace the need may outpace the technical abilities and we'll have to get more creative multiple data lakes instead of one for example that work together and that sort of thing but gpus are going to be part of the solution more cheap storage such as cloud storage and what all the hyperscalers are doing and providing to us that's part of the solution as well but if we're collecting all this data we need to be using it it does, makes no good to collect it and so those of us that are in the know about data have a responsibility to our organizations to demonstrate what the possibilities are by exploiting and using the data that we have and if if they're not getting called continually, we need more data, we need more data, we need more data, then they're not doing their job because they need to be expressing back to the business what they can be doing with the data. And if they do a good job with that, the business is gonna to come to the technology team and say, we need more data. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenges we have today, there's 123 zettabytes of data on the planet. If you took DVDs or CDs and stacked them one on top of another, go 94 times between the moon and it's grown at 68% per year. So that data, you know, you're right about it, but we have, you know, I talked to the head of the quantum lab at Harvard. I've spoken to Nobel, uh, lead author of the Nobel, this data problem we have, these challenges we have, you know, do you think, I mean, think about where we are today, but another three or four years, if we don't solve that problem, how in the world are people going to be able to, they're going to be paralyzed, right? It's called learned helplessness because they're so overwhelmed with data. What do we need to do to be able to address those? You know, think about it. You got Slack, Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, LinkedIn, Google Drive, Dropbox, Box, all your email addresses, and then other repositories. But yet we don't have a cross-platform search that can look for that stuff in a very intuitive way to be able to help us, right? It's interesting why that has not been developed. The problems that I stated before that, that you stated about uh, the enterprise and the world in general, every enterprise has that problem scaled appropriately. Even as individuals, we have that challenge. I have that challenge that, that you spoke of. My data is here, there and everywhere, right? So I think AI is gonna be a really big part of the answer. We see in the new releases of Office, Microsoft is going to be putting ChatGPT into, the, into those new releases. And it's going to have the ability, like, for example, into Teams, which I've tested, into Teams. And that's going to have the ability to reach into all of the pockets of data that you have and recommend, here's what you should be doing next. So oh, great. Well, wow, we can't personally continually analyze all of the data that's at our disposal, AI can, if it's trained appropriately. So that's gonna be part of this, a big part of the solution. So we'll stay ahead of the curve that way. So tell everybody, so you know, we have companies from all over the world. Um, we have startups from all over the planet, Corporate, corporates watch my show. Tell us a little bit, so how can they um, uh, work with you? What, what can you do for them? I know you do consulting, uh, and you work with a lot of global 2000 and some mid-market companies, but where would they come to you uh, for some assistance? You can when find us at uh, mcknightcg.com and we do a significant amount of work for the vendors. You mentioned vendors. We, we do a significant amount of work for vendors in the space that have a strong value proposition and need to get the word out. So we run benchmarks. We do white papers. Uh, I appear on webinars for these vendors and so on. We have a lot of creative uh, industry analyst type of products. So we, we can break down a whole industry 
for a vendor, their industry, we can publish that or not. It can be part of the product roadmap or it can be a competitive thing. We feature engineering led research and we are hands-on analysts. We're not, you know, pie in the sky. Here's theoretically what it should be, but we live it day to day. We're out there with your customers as a vendor, your customers. And we, we speak that language. We help you understand them and we help them understand you with these products. No, that's great. So, you know, like I said, a lot of startups watch a show. If you were back uh, going back to Southern Adventist uh, University, what advice would you give yourself today coming into this new world with the ChatGPT and this new uh, generative AI, et cetera? What would you say to yourself coming in as a freshman in the university? What would you what would you do differently? I, I would I would try to think think beyond the day to day. It that's hard for a, a teenager, or whatever you are, and in university, right? But think think beyond, think where is this going? Because very, very few people actually do that. And those are the people that are ahead of the curve. They're getting ahead. They see the trends before they happen and they're able to lead. And so to be a leader, you have to think ahead. So look at the technology that they're teaching you. Look at the technology broader in the market and where's it going? What, what can be done with this that isn't being done now? And what do the technological advances that are happening mean for the future? And if we did that back then, we probably would have seen something like this today. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of uh, people who, who did that. And I think that's great. So I would like to be a little bit more, have a little bit more foresight. And that's that's hard for a college student, but... I yeah, you're trying to worry about where they're going to go down to the cafeteria and get the beans that are left. <laughs> no, I get it. So any closing thoughts and um, what's the best way to reach you? Reach me through my website at mcknightcg.com. And it's all there. You can read our research. You can see my presentations, a lot of links to uh, our articles and our services and everything is there. And I am, I'm happy to speak with anybody about what you're doing with your data, what you could be doing with your data, what the possibilities are. And I try to stay ahead of the curve for you. That's great. William, I want to thank you for taking time out of your business schedule to join the show today. And to my audience out there, thank you for joining one more time. GSD presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech. And I'm your host, Gary Fowler. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay healthy. And I'll be back to you again uh, Thursday. Thank you very much. Take care, William. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.